Well, good uh, afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to our webinar. Um, I'm uh, Paul Burlton uh, from LISTIS, um, and um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker um, for the third in our series of webinars. Um, so, uh, so Colin Darby has joined us today. Um, Colin is a financial crime expert. Um, he has 15 years experience in crime compliance and risk management. Um, and he's done supervision, policy and enforcement roles um, and has been a regulator um, and a financial crime change and, and, and advisory work as a consultant. Um, so he's joined us today um, to give you um, a briefing um, and um, I'd like to um, hand over to him and um, I hope you enjoy our webinar today. Um, just a couple of points of, um, just a couple of points of um, housekeeping. Um, you, everybody should be on mute. Um, so if you want to ask any uh, questions, then if you type the questions in the chat, um, that would be great. Um, and then I'm going to hold a Q&A at the end. I'll read out the questions if you've got any. Um, and I'll also ask any questions that we've had sent to us on emails and everything. Um, so without any further ado, I'll hand over to Colin um, and um, uh, please, uh, please enjoy. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks for that kind introduction and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, support this uh, series of webinars and for running the AML and KYC Leaders Group at all. Um, as, uh, as we've all heard many times, it takes a network to fight a network. So very pleased to be able to uh, participate in, uh, in this endeavour. Uh, as Paul has already explained, uh, I'm a, a regulator turned consultant and have been um, working on financial crime compliance and risk management matters for the last 15 years or so. So uh, I like to think I've seen a few of the changes over that time. Um, uh, and the, uh, the topic we're looking at today is uh, the concept of moving beyond technical compliance um, and towards potentially more effective controls. Um, and I just thought I'd start by uh, giving some of the uh, the context around why discuss this matter at all, and why discuss it now. Uh, if I go back to 2013, um, some people might remember that the, uh, the Financial Action Task Force, our international standard setter, updated its mutual evaluation review process um, to include what were referred to as um, outcomes, as well as um, uh, testing compliance against its uh, its recommendations. And the uh, the idea there was to not just test the uh, on-paper effectiveness of the, uh, the on-paper design even of national AML regimes, but to, to look at how they're working in practice. However, the, uh, that approach hasn't necessarily completely cascaded down. Uh, more recently, we've seen the French Action Task Force at their most recent plenary calling out that not all supervisors are necessarily taking the most effective risk-based approach to supervision. Um, and back in December 2019, we saw the, the Wolfsburg Group publishing a statement on effectiveness uh, within the context of anti-money laundering and financial crime systems and controls. And their view was that um, national supervisors are still focused very much on technical compliance rather than focusing on the practical element of whether AML programs are really making a, a practical difference and a meaningful difference in the fight against financial crime. Um, and that there's still insufficient consideration of whether a firm's AML and CTF program is effective in achieving the overall goals of the, uh, the national regime and the international regime within which it, it sits as a part of the ecosystem. Uh, and as a result, they see, and bearing in mind the Wolfsburg Group is a group of financial institutions, um, they see a significant amount of time and effort to practices which are designed to achieve technical compliance, whilst not necessarily optimizing the detection or deterrence to illicit activity. And along similar themes, with, uh, in February this year, the, the US government, um, the Department of Treasury, published its updated illicit finance strategy as a key priority in there of improving the efficiency and effectiveness of the regulatory framework for financial institutions. Some of you will have seen that in March 2020, uh, the European Banking Federation published a blueprint uh, for moving towards a more effective EU AML framework. Um, and as we've touched on, the Financial Action Task Force is calling for more effective national level supervision. Um, and even more recently, the FCA's latest business plan speaks to a focus on end outcomes and highlights that it will be looking at changing the way it goes about 
um, supervising firms' financial crime systems and controls. And even as it stands currently, there's already an expectation that firms are doing things like having an MLO report that covers the effectiveness of their financial crime systems controls. And they have a director or senior manager with overall responsibility for maintaining effective AML systems and controls. This concept of effectiveness is, is kind of weaved into what we've already got in place at the moment, but as an open question as to whether we are, um, whether we're yet doing as much as we could do to achieve effectiveness. And uh, to that end, under the auspices of the Economic Crime Plan, uh, HM Treasury is due to lead a review of the effectiveness of the UK's money laundering rates starting next year. It's due to report in summer 2022. Um, and as we speak, an innovation working group is looking at how regulatory technology can improve the effectiveness of firms financial crime systems and controls. So that's, that's kind of why we're talking about effectiveness. But I wanted to uh, run you through uh, some, some key figures and numbers. So it's 86 billion. That was a recent study by one of the large data, uh, financial crime data and technology vendors that revealed that 86 billion annually is about the total spend across European financial institutions on compliance a year. That is a, not a small amount of money. And if you break it down to a, um, a large or mid-sized UK firm, it's a spend of 43 million annually on financial crime compliance. Again, you know, could we be making better use of those funds? 10%. Right? Across Europe, banks and other financial services firms are deploying about 10% of their current headcount on financial crime compliance and operations. This translates to an average of about 83 full-time employees when you look across the industry. The 37 billion, many of you have heard this, but it's the often cited figure for the, the cost of organized and serious organized crime to the UK economy per year, 37 billion pounds. And then of course, we don't actually know for sure how much money is laundered through the UK, but we do have the reference to the economic crime plan that calls it out as being potentially tens of billions of pounds. Again, you know, you think about the downstream harm that sort of money can do. And then at the end of it, we've got this 1% figure. Uh, 1%, 1% 1 of what? Uh, you know, 1% refers to the number of uh, prosecutions that are actually comp completed and the proportion of, uh, of estimated illicit assets through the European financial system that are actually restrained through criminal or civil means. So we've got all of their spend going on, lots of people deployed, um, but what's it all achieving? in the current setup is effectively the question that's being asked at the moment. And hence why various organizations are thinking about, can we do it differently? So turning to what does effectiveness actually mean in the context of the financial institutions, anti money laundering and counter-terrorist financing systems and controls? Well, this is something that the Wolfsburg Group sought to shed light on uh, back in the last year when they published their statement on effectiveness. And they called out three key components of our, of our firm's AML CTF program. First of those being legal and regulatory compliance. Uh, and the second, provision of information to authorities. So suspicious activity reports, production orders, even extending through to the concept of currency transaction and, and suspicious transaction reports in different jurisdictions. And thirdly, having appropriate risk-based controls. You know, still tying in with the concept of a, of a risk-based approach under which you do risk assessments, you have a risk appetite, and you design your control environment to mitigate the risks to what you consider to be an acceptable level given the nature of your business. So probably no great surprises across those three components, um, but there was a key message in there, that if current controls and practices don't achieve any of those three points, they should be discontinued. Because what's the, what's the business case, what's the, uh, the economic rationale for actually continuing to deploy that resource in that way on that particular process or executing that particular, particular control if it's not helping you achieve compliance, if it's not passing intelligence, valuable intelligence to authorities, and it's not a part, an effective part of your risk-based approach. Now, since the statement's been published, there's been a bit of a debate as to, you know, should these three, um, three outcomes or you know, three goals be prioritized and uh, how, should, how should firms tackle them? Uh, but actually, my take on this is it's the third one that's most important. Um, because if you don't have appropriate financial crime risk controls, the likelihood of achieving legal and regulatory compliance probably falls. And a firm's ability to provide authorities with valuable intelligence 
probably also undermined if the, uh, if the risk-based controls aren't appropriate in the first place. Okay, uh, so I want to take us on to taking a look at some uh, current control components and you know, posing a question, I'm playing devil's advocate slightly, as to whether current approaches could be tweaked for more effectiveness um, and whether we're actually achieving best value for money with the way that uh, we're advising firms and uh, firms are actually doing things at the, at the moment. So if you look at business risk assessments, now there's, there's a panoply of practice on business risk assessments. There are, uh, despite the fact that we've got a legal requirement written into the money laundering regs, to uh, take account of external information and to do business level risk assessments and keep them up to date. There are still organizations that haven't done their risk assessments. Um, there are some that do them and put them in a drawer. Uh, and then there are some that have invested very heavily in making their risk assessments an almost year round exercise. And in some cases, they're arguably over engineered and take up a lot of time and effort, but don't always necessarily bring to light specific threats typologies or risks. And we're very used to looking at risk assessments in the, uh, through the lens of what's the exposure through the customer base? What's the exposure through our, um, our products and our services? What risks are we running through the transactions that we undertake? How does that risk vary across jurisdictions? Are there any external factors around our operating environment that bring us additional risks? Now that's not to say that those, uh, those vectors aren't the right things to look at, but if risk assessments don't call out the specific risks and threats that a firm is exposed to, what's the likelihood of being able to map product controls to those risks in order to demonstrate to ourselves internally and externally that we're actually mitigating the risk exposure. And then uh, a bit of an old favorite of mine, it's a, a topic that you know, many people have raised with me over the years, but the concept of address verification. Now, if you go, go back 10 years, go back 15 years, it was quite a strong argument for doing address verification because it was potentially useful to law enforcement and it helped them identify where people were. And depending on the business, uh, the business model and the products being offered, it can still be a case to do address verification, and particularly if you're lending and taking the property as security. Um, and that would be a good argument for doing address verification. But otherwise, is it actually that helpful? If you look at the JMLSG guidance, uh, and for a standard uh, individual customer, that will call out that we're expected to collect their name, their date of birth, and their address, and then verify the name and either the date of birth or the address. So it's perfectly possible under the current framework to have unverified addresses. And that's actually reinforced by the, the fund transfer regulation, which despite its requirements for transmitting things like um, a payer and payee, ben, payer and payee information to accompany payments, the, uh, the guidance supporting that recognises that addresses might be unverified. But still, we have lots of firms insisting that when they do onboarding and when they're doing customer refresh exercises, they need to verify address. But why? You know, law enforcement have got more effective ways of identifying where someone is now. They can triangulate mobile phones. They can trace credit cards and payment cards. Um, and they can follow IP addresses. Um, and they can access GPS data. So there's, a, there's arguably less upstream benefit to doing address verification. And then things like static, uh, static customer risk assessment. So again, customer risk assessment, a very, very live topic. Many firms have, have invested lots of time and effort at looking at their customer risk assessment models. Are they using the right levers, the right risk indicators, the right risk factors? Are they all weighted appropriately? Are the outcomes justifiable in terms of who's badged as high risk and low risk? Is it driving appropriate um, following on processes in terms of uh, the risk sensitivity of customer due diligence and ongoing monitoring? And does it tie into the overall risk framework appropriately? So there are lots of discussion around customer risk assessment. But if there's a point in time exercise and the uh, risk factors are publicly known, they're in the JMSG guidance, they're in the EBA's guidelines, so it's very easy for someone wanting to game the system to build an understanding of how customer risk assessment works and you know, present a clean profile or a profile that appears not to be unnecessary, not to be unnecessary or particularly risky, but then undertake all manner of activity um, that doesn't actually match up with that profile. And yes, you know, in some cases, transaction monitoring might pick it up. If the transaction monitoring doesn't connect into, into the customer risk assessment module, 
such that the customer risk, risk assessment module gets a degree of dynamism, what's the likelihood of that view of customer risk being reflective of actual activity and the firm running that model having a degree of comfort as to the effectiveness of its customer risk assessment process? In effect, there could be lots of high risk activity almost hiding amongst low risk customers. And that brings us on to transaction monitoring in itself. Now, a mixture of approaches. Some firms have built their own systems in house. More firms have, uh, have deployed third party solutions. Um, some of those deployments were a number of years ago. Uh, there, are, there are firms out there who have let their vendor contracts lapse and no longer have vendor support on their third party transaction monitoring system or don't necessarily have the in house capacity or bandwidth to keep their monitoring scenarios up to date. Now, you know, the theory runs that if, you, if you've done your risk assessment and I've identified a change in your risk exposure, whether that's a new risk that's emerged or an increase in either the inherent or residual risk exposure to a particular typology, I should start, you know, go back to your controls and think, do I need to mitigate this risk further? Can I deploy a new transaction scenario, transaction monitoring scenario? Um, oh, what else can I do to mitigate this risk? That's a lot of effort. So, you know, there's plenty of transaction monitoring solutions out there that aren't necessarily aligned to the latest risks outside of a firm that might impact or come through a firm's book. Okay. Uh, so, transaction monitoring, not necessarily as effective as it might be. And adverse media, just as another example. Now, there are plenty of solutions available as to how adverse media screening can be done in-house and using third parties and as an on a managed service basis but it's more about what firms do with the information when it comes out uh, you know throughout right throughout my career in financial crime compliance i've seen plenty of examples of firms that will say yes yeah we've got a flag as to some adverse media we're aware of allegations against our customer or the customer beneficial owner we've looked into those allegations uh, they seem to come from credible sources but you know, there's not been a conviction yet or there's not been any action taken by an authority. Uh, we've not had a direction from a regulator. So we're just going to go with it. We're just going to continue running with it. Uh, you know, if, if firms take that approach, um, which arguably there, you know, there's, there's flexibility to do under a risk-based approach, but if firms continue to take that approach, has the risk not already crystallised? Uh, if you wait until a conviction comes through, which could be four, five, six years after the event, if not longer, or if you wait until some sort of regulatory um, regulatory intervention, uh, you know, won't, you know, won't the risk event already have occurred? Won't the illicit, the illicit funds already have flowed through your account and your services? So yeah, if you follow that through, you know, is there a business case and uh, a risk management case to actually take action about adverse media earlier and potentially revisit risk appetites and tolerance thresholds around what's actually considered to be um, what's actually considered to be, be adverse and outside of a, a firm's risk appetite. So those are just a, a few examples of where we might think about you know, is what we're doing at the moment really the best or the most effective way to use our finite resource. I might just pause there in case there's any questions already. Um, Anyone wants to Colin, question on the chat? There haven't been any questions that have come up so far. Nobody's. Um nobody's posted any um, just to remind okay. everybody if you want to post any questions there's a Q&A um, uh, on the uh, on the app on the zoom app so just post your questions in there and then I'll read them out to Colin okay so we move on to a bit of hypothesizing about what um, effective controls might include? What are the key components of a potentially more effective control program? Now, it won't necessarily be a new concept, but it's the, the concept of layered controls. So we've got preventative controls that are designed to stop the risk entering the firm at all. Detective controls that operate to spot risk if they have entered the firm system, either because it's not possible to deploy a preventative control or the preventative control has failed or there was a weakness in it. And reactive controls, which would look to limit the damage or the spread uh, of a crystallized risk, because it's got through the first two layers, preventative or detective, and then remedial. So uh, 
we, we've taken action, that would be the, uh, for example, where we've taken action on a specific case. Uh, let's say it's a, a customer exit scenario. Uh, you, you've worked out as a firm that the customer's beyond your risk appetite and you no longer want to service them or there's a legal blocker on servicing them. For example, they've become sanctioned. So you don't have to close the account. But then you loop back after that and say, well, actually, is there, was there a problem amongst our, our controls that allowed this risk to crystallize in the first place? If not, fantastic, move on. But if there was, you know, consider how, how broad that issue was and whether there needs to be a control change to plug that gap. And then within that cycle, so we, now we refer to it as the life cycle of controls, uh, this, sorry, excuse me, uh, there's room for you know, many different um, concepts to, to, to slot in. Uh, one thing we're seeing increasingly is the concept of many to many and multi purpose controls. Now, particularly seeing this come up where firms are bringing back together their financial crime compliance and risk mitigation functions. Uh, so we're talking about dynamic controls and the, uh, the concept of controls being highly responsive to customer and transactional activity. Uh, so it's, uh, it's possible to move beyond the, uh, the static customer risk assessment models to take account of um, the actual activity that's going through. And some examples I've seen, it's, uh, it's even uh, use of transaction scoring models, uh, looking at the entities involved in transactions, and putting risk scores to the different types of entities involved, whether it's personal entities, corporate entities, different types of merchant code, um, looking at multi-party transactions, and then effectively aggregating risk scores up from all the transactional activity, and then rescoring the, the customer level risk accordingly, which can drive through to doing additional due diligence or potentially applying a different set of transaction monitoring scenarios that might apply a bit more scrutiny. Okay, um, and in, is it worth noting that actually, um, according to recent uh, recent surveys and research, nearly four out of ten European firms have migrated towards dynamic transaction monitoring. So it is possible to get to dynamic controls. Uh, leveraging external information, um, there's lots of organisations out there that produce very valuable information on what the latest threats and emerging risks are. Uh, we've got our standard sectors like the Financial Action Task Force. Governments, regulators, law enforcement, um, just in the UK, for example, our national FIU produce a lot of information on threat assessments and sector alerts. Um, think tanks, uh, many of you will have seen the output from the likes of uh, the, the Centre for Financial Crime Studies at RUSI, um, Transparency International, Global Witness, uh, all producing very insightful material on current and emerging threats, typologies and risks relating to money laundering, counter-terrorist financing and sanctions. Um, so that's all available to be utilised and firms that have um, the capacity internally to, uh, to monitor and manage their own uh, flow of intelligence are also looking to factor that internal flow of intelligence into the design of their controls. There's a whole concept of being um, intelligence-based or intelligence-led. It's also in important not to forget the basics. Uh, whilst we see criminals and bad actors uh, using more and more sophisticated techniques to get their funds into the system or bypass controls, or take advantage of um, areas where there might be weaknesses, there are still only, uh, a, still only a handful of ways in which criminal proceeds or terrorist fun funding can actually be moved. We've got through mainstream financial services, physical movements of cash, through informal value transfer mechanisms like Awala, through the transfer of assets, uh, for example, property, art, and other high-value goods, um, and through the international trade system. So there are only many, there are so many angles of attack um, that the criminals and the bad actors can can use. I've also got on here at the top right, think like a bad actor. Um, that doesn't mean put yourself in the shoes of Steven Seagal. Apologies to any Steven Seagal fans. Actually, it means uh, if we can understand the behaviour of criminals and their associates, the chances of um, deploying controls that actually look to detect, um, based on risk indicators, the, the criminal activity uh, should be greater. So if we can deploy a criminal or bad actor mindset into our controls, it might become more effective. Uh, and some firms are going down the road now of trying to uh, identify and quantify uh, what are referred to as offence level indicators, uh, which can also support later effectiveness testing.
And then we've got appropriate use of technology and data. Um, people will have heard this a lot recently. Regulators are very much on board with the use of technology and data. Uh, FCA included within that, but also regulators in other major financial centers out in the US, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Australia, and, and elsewhere within, uh, within the, EU, the EU as well. And that, that's because technology can increase the accuracy and efficiency of, of our financial crime controls and processes. But the flip side of that is we shouldn't just use technology for the sake of it. It's not a safe harbor. Uh, technology should only be used where it's subject to appropriate selection rigor, calibration, governance, oversight, and all. Um, so yeah, we were talking about appropriate use of technology and data, and that there should be appropriate uh, rigor around the selection, calibration, governance, and ongoing testing. Uh, and firms shouldn't deploy technology they don't fully understand or cannot explain. I mean, any firms that have had a, a visit from the FCA in the last couple of years may well have found that they have to stand up a demo of their systems. And, uh, someone, uh, quite typically the MRO, or the internal owner of the system will be put on the spot to explain why the system was chosen, um, why it was calibrated the way it is, how it operates, um, and how the firm gets comfort that, that technology is achieving what it's designed and intended to be achieved. So you sh it should always be possible to explain to both internal stakeholders and external stakeholders how that technology deployment helps to mitigate risks. We've already touched on the concept of avoiding silos and seeking synergies, um, but there are, there are many forms of financial crime, um, different threats, different typologies, and bad actors will do what they can to get their funds into their system, into the financial system, and achieve their objectives. They won't restrain themselves to just money laundering, or just terrorist financing, or just sanction circumvention. So it's worth thinking about how all your different teams and functions can come together and be synced up where appropriate to not just deploy the controls and run the controls, but share intelligence and potentially spot networks. I think collaboration um, is a key point. Uh, this comes out loud and clear from the economic crime plan, um, which is designed in essence to be a public private partnership. But in order to get to a point of effective collaboration between public sector and private sector, we probably need to get to a point where we're collaborating effectively within firms, across groups, across jurisdictions, um, and between different firms in different parts of, uh, of the, the industry as well. Uh, we've seen some very successful mechanisms emerge over the last few, year, few years. Um, Jimlet has been much trumpeted, as has the, the Joint Fraud Task Force as a means of sharing intelligence and enabling firms to take, uh, take action based on government um, and public sector information and for that feedback loop to come into play. Um, and it's the, it's, if in effect, the economic crime plan is looking to extend the Jimlet cooperation model onto a grand scale. So, you know, wherever there's an opportunity to collaborate and there's a legal basis to do so, um, you know, firms should be looking to do that as far as possible. Uh, I've got proactive threat detection on here. Uh, this is something we've seen a few firms um, up their game on recently. Um, and it's not, just, uh, it's not just taking account of the, uh, the publications by the bodies I referred to earlier, but also looking across data and looking, uh, looking at the horizon and beyond, seeing what threats might be coming to us in the near future. Can we be prepared for those threats or can we react very early to deploy updated and new controls before the firm um, is materially impacted, before groups of firms are materially impacted, and before industry as a whole is impacted. Um, I think the scale of that functionality will see vary depending on the size of the firm and the resources it can bring to bear. But I, I've uh, seen a few examples in the last couple of years where uh, that ability to do horizon scanning and pick up the emerging threats has, um, has, has has genuinely enabled a firm to deploy new controls, protect itself, uh, and in the course of doing so, um, put themselves in a positive position with the regulator. Uh, on the right-hand side here, about monitoring and testing, it's, it's absolutely imperative that firms have an ev evidential basis for, for believing and knowing that their controls are, are operating effectively and as intended. And now, testing adherence to policies and procedures is one aspect of that. Um, as we've seen through some of the enforcement actions taken over the last few years that a material deviation from documented policies and procedures is a very easy win for regulators, not just on AML matters, but across financial crime more generally. The testing needs to extend across the whole framework, the whole program and framework with the firm. 
uh, because weaknesses can arise in not just the, not just the design of the controls, uh, the policies, procedures, and the processes, but also on the human resources, uh, through staff and third party conduct and capability, um, you know, whether there's actually enough uh, people in place to provide the bandwidth to get through the, the work that's required under the, the AML program. And weaknesses can also arise in the technology that we've already referred to, um, either through its design, whether it's proportionate to risk, whether it's properly calibrated, and whether the output is used appropriately. So, you know, testing really needs to go all the way across the board. But it can, it, the testing in itself can be deployed um, on a risk based approach. Uh, and one evolution that we've seen over the last couple of years is deploying testing resources uh, with a focus onto the aspects of system control, systems and controls where there's greatest dependence. And, and by greatest dependence, we mean the areas where the gap between the assessed inherent risk and the desired residual risk under the firm's risk appetite is greatest. Like where do you need your controls to have the biggest impact? Um, so if we deploy testing resources on where we have the greatest dependence on controls, that should give us the greatest level of, of internal comfort that the controls are operating um, as they were intended to. Uh, and there's, uh, there's also quite a key message around controls and you know, measuring their effectiveness in terms of having a real world, real world impact. So it's straightforward enough to track things like how many transaction monitoring alerts have been generated and what proportion of those are escalated through investigation and later convert into suspicious activity reports. But there is, in those circumstances, no single right answer. Um, it's the same for the number of customers declined or exited. Uh, every, every firm can track that information individually, but there is no magic single right answer. We, uh, we, and uh, as a consultant, and uh, I'm sure other firms of other consulting firms have found similar, we sometimes get asked for benchmarking exercises. You know, how do how do our, how does our setup compare to that being operated by our peers? And yeah, whilst that's nice to know, all of those numbers help us understand whether we're having a real world impact on the management of financial crime risk. And the key objective here is it's still the same as a risk based approach deploy finite resources to best effect. Now, it's not possible to completely eliminate financial crime risk. It's often said the only way to achieve that would be to close down the entirety of the financial services system. And that's never going to happen. That's not even happened in the current circumstances. So it's not going to happen to, um, to, to um, manage financial crime risk. Okay, so looking forward, now how, might, how might we do things differently? Now, some people might have come across this concept before, but taking more of an, an outcomes focused approach, I thought we might take a, a few minutes to look at what outcomes might be desirable from a firm's AML CTF program. The first one I've got on here, and uh, I've tried to do this graphically just, for, uh, just to uh, avoid having too many words on the screen, but preventing known bad actors and their associates from accessing the financial system. That sounds like a good thing to achieve. Detecting the bad actors that are already in the system and limiting their access. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean exiting them completely, but if you've got someone who is misusing or abusing their lending products, but seems to be, seems to be using their credit base, um, sorry, their current account if, um, quite normally, um, then you might limit the, the different products and services they're offered. And that concept can be applied across different lines of business and different product sets. Spotting, investigating, and stopping transactions or other activity which indicate a high risk of association with criminal activity. Uh, now, this is all about looking for the signals. Uh, transaction monitoring plus, if you like. And then blocking payments or other activities for the benefit of sanctions targets. No, absolutely. We don't, we don't want to be making payments or providing any form of support for people on SDN lists or the people associated to SDNs or other sanctions targets or the subject of other embargoes. Preventing staff from facilitating financial crime. Now, that facilitation could be witting, it can be unwitting. There have been instances in the past where members of staff have been subject to disciplinary procedures for not doing enough to prevent financial crime or not having spotted the risks and taken appropriate action. In other cases, there's been active involvement from staff in um, in sharing information such as the uh, the calibration of transaction monitoring systems or 
um, how to get around customer risk assessment models, on how to how to game customer due diligence processes. Uh, so absolutely, we want to prevent staff from, from becoming involved, um, whether deliberately or otherwise. Keeping personal and sensitive data secure, a bit of a crossover to the, the GDPR environment. Um, but you know, if, if data comes into the wrong hands, then it can be used to facilitate financial crime, particularly around identity theft and account takeover. So we absolutely need to keep personal and sensitive data secure. Early identification of new typologies. This goes back to the, the proactivity point. Identifying new typologies is good for one firm, it's good for groups of firms, it's good for the whole industry, uh, and it's good for the regulatory organizations as well. Sharing valuable intelligence with peers. We know we've really touched on the value of some of the organizations and channels like Gymlet, like the Joint Fraud Task Force. Um, but if the, the concept here is if, if firm A has got one part of the picture, firm B has got another part of the picture, and firm C, which is another downstream institution receiving some of the, uh, the proceeds of transactions going through firms A and B, uh, if they don't come together and join that picture up, uh, what's the likelihood of that, that money laundering ring or organized crime group being disrupted? So if we can look at ways to bring that intelligence together, even if it's pre-SAR, um, because there was a, the industry's campaign for a legal basis to do that, it was written into the Criminal Finances Act, um, then that should be all to the good. And then submitting high quality and valuable intelligence to authorities. Okay. We're currently trying to do that through SARS, but there's a big SAR reform program going on because we know that the NCA has not got the, either the IT or the bandwidth to be able to effectively triage all of the reports, um, extract all the intelligence that they might extract and task, and task them out appropriately. So there's a high level of frustration within the, within the industry as to um, whether all their effort around submitting SARS is wasted um, and whether other parts of the regulated sector are pulling their weight on um, submitting uh, suspicious activity reports. But what's the point we're getting to here? So, like we've thrown up these thrown up these nine outcomes, which all sound on the face of it desirable. But if we had these nine outcomes in mind whilst we are designing and reviewing the design of controls and potentially work from the outcomes backwards, we might get to a to a more effective approach than one that, that might be achieved by looking at rules and regulations forwards. And also risk appetite can be based on outcomes. You know, a firm with a higher risk appetite might be more tolerant of failures to achieve these outcomes. And I should say these outcomes aren't necessarily exhaustive. These are just the uh, examples that most, uh, most readily come to light through some of the work that uh, my colleagues and I have been up to over the last few years. Um, you'll probably have other outcomes you'd want to include in your, in your own programs. But there is the, the, the point is there's potential value to be gained in terms of effectiveness and potentially efficiency by maintaining a focus on outcomes when we go through the process of designing and redesigning control environments. Okay, so just to, to wrap up before we might take any questions, just a few key messages to leave you with. That financial crime is about risk management. It's not just compliance. It would be perfectly possible to build a control environment um, and a, a, an AML framework that ticks all of the boxes on what the FCA guide says uh, or what the German Street guidance says, but you may still have financial crime risk flowing through your business. So it's definitely about risk management and not just compliance. Design and deploy the approach that fits your circumstances and have confidence in it. If you've done the analysis to identify the risks and you're comfortable that you've mapped those risks to appropriate controls and you've tested the controls regularly to get comfort that they're, they're operating as intended, then you should have confidence, both internally and confidence in front of the regulator. Our regulators will continue to make judgments on judgments, but bear in mind that it's unusual that uh, many of, the, many of the, the personnel that do financial crime supervision um, and do financial crime enforcement at regulators this is speaking from my own experience as a regulator, uh, they don't have necessarily been financial crime risk managers. Uh, and there's no guarantee that they will understand your firm as well as you do. So you know, be open with them, be honest with them, be respectful with them, but don't be afraid to challenge a view they might have reached. They've not necessarily got the level of on the ground understanding that you do.
Uh, taking an intelligence-based and outcomes-focused approach uh, should help us to move beyond technical compliance towards control environments that can be demonstrably shown to be keeping financial crime risk out of the system or keeping financial crime risk down. However, that said, no approach is perfect and we'll always have some form and extent of financial crime. But the problem at the moment is it's just getting bigger and bigger and it's, it's definitely not going to go away. And we've touched on this a couple of times already, but collaboration is crucial at, uh, at firm level, at group level and at industry level. By pulling together, greater effectiveness is achievable. Hopefully that's uh, been useful. Apologies for the couple of dropouts along the way. Um, probably a good time now to hand back to, to Paul so we can do some Q&A. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Colin. Um, that, was, that was really interesting. Yeah, so apologies everybody for the, uh, uh, for the dropouts. Um, hopefully that was still interesting for you all. Um, I've got a few questions. Um, I wanted to ask a couple first, Colin. Um, so just thinking about this approach and thinking about um, effectiveness and um, you know, you know and, and, and potentially kind of you know tweaking your approach. I mean, does this mean that firms need to effectively rip up their AML frameworks? What what would your advice be in terms of looking at the current frameworks? I wouldn't personally advocate going as far as completely starting again. Um, now, because not many uh, firms are in the fortunate position of having a complete greenfield to play with, there's been legacy investments to be to be realised. I think it's more about taking a step back, almost hitting pause, as it were, but just taking the time to critically evaluate which controls are actually making a difference. Um, some controls will already be effective, fantastic, carry on running them. Some could be improved through minor adjustments, um, and that's not a bad position to be in either. Other controls might need a bit of a major overhaul. If, for example, a, a set of um, payment screening filters haven't been recalibrated in the last 15 years, as I saw with one firm recently, and that might need addressing. Um, but there are, it's also possible that some controls could just be dispensed with. A, uh, take it back to the address verification example. I'm personally completely convinced that there are firms doing address verification when they really don't need to. There's almost no benefit to it. Um, but the, there's a golden rule, uh, as ever. Now, if you make a change to your systems and controls, record why you're doing it. Uh, evidence, evidence, and evidence. Gotcha. Okay, now that, that's helpful. And um, and just looking at your your comments here around the key messages about risk management, um, that first sentence there has a key word in it, uh, not just compliance. Um, I mean, what would you say to firms that um, prioritise risk management over compliance? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. So, so obviously you put there risk management, not just compliance. Um, if, if, depending on how you read that comment, um, what would you say to firms who would prioritise risk management over compliance? Well, I mean, prioritising risk management is to be encouraged, but it's not meant to be, uh, it's not meant to convey that compliance requirements should be ignored. Um, but if you look at the requirements of an organization like the FCA, uh, they've repeatedly set out their interest in out end outcomes uh, and encourage the use of technology to improve the effectiveness of financial crime controls. Uh, and arguably taking steps to drive up the overall effectiveness of financial crime systems controls um, fits within the reasonable steps expected of a senior manager under the, the senior managers uh, and certification regime. Um, and just to, to reinforce that, the, the FCA, one of their specific CIS rules, um, actually goes as far as saying that the senior manager should be accountable and responsible for effective AML systems and controls. There's a key word in there, effective. Um, so by baking the achievement of compliance into financial crime risk management, we should be able to get to a position where compliance is effectively a byproduct of sensible financial crime risk management. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's also worth bearing in mind that you know, regulators are being pushed themselves to adopt more effective risk-based approaches to supervision. And that is essentially to give firms the room to make their judgments and manage their risks appropriately. Okay, that's, that's, that's great. Thanks, Colin. Um, I also was thinking about technology, actually, when you were talking about that, you were talking about technology and data being able to help um, in the process. 
Um, and you also talked about understanding the technology and what it's doing. It's kind of one of my uh, pet subjects um, that you pro probably know. Um, but how do people test the effectiveness of the technology? Have you got any um, thoughts or any ideas and, and you know, for, for people here and around testing the effectiveness of the technology itself? Yeah, so this is a little bit of a pet topic because I've been asked a few times over the, over the years to, uh, to do uh, effectiveness testing jobs on different technology solutions. Um, and it's possible to do that manually. Um, looking at input and output testing. So, for example, you can test uh, name, screening, uh, name screening processes and uh, payment monitoring and sanction screening filters by deliberately pushing through dummy data that you know contains uh, SDNs or other sanctions targets. And if, you know, by pushing in those cases, you can test um, whether the filters are flagging all the things they should flag uh, and conversely not flagging the things that shouldn't be flagged. And depending on the outcomes from that testing, you can look to um, recalibrate the filters accordingly. But there are, um, there are increasing a uh, number of organizations that have dedicated technology testing solutions. Um, they have already got pre-built dummy data, sandboxes, automated testing capability, um, which can look at the key um, technology components whether it's identity verification solutions, whether it's name screening, whether it's transaction monitoring, whether it's payment filtering. Um, and, and those services have arisen and become increasingly popular over the last few years because some regulators have gone down the road of mandating um, testing and certification. And one example that comes to mind is uh, the New York Department of Financial Services and their Part 504 rules around transaction monitoring and, and payment filtering systems. And that includes an explicit requirement um, but an officer of the firm has to annually certi certify the robustness and appropriateness of the program. Um, and you know, the, the firms out there won't do that um, unless they've got some uh, ex either a, a reliable internal capability to, to do that sort of testing or some external support to do it. Yeah, and it's all, it's all back to your point, isn't it, about understanding what the systems are doing, isn't it, right? Um, if you don't understand the systems, then you've got no idea of uh, how effective they are, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a nasty example. I did a piece of work with a, uh, with a firm who I won't name last year who um, were concerned that they hadn't had a reason to look at their payment filtering process for the last few years, it hadn't been recalibrated, but they were at a high level comfortable because they hadn't generated any um, payment screening alerts. So we, so we posed them the question, okay, have you looked underneath this? Have you, have you genuinely had no transaction that would have alerted? And they couldn't answer the question. Um, mm. That's not to say they definitely had transactions that should have alerted, but you've got to be able to get to that next level down to, to get that comfort internally and to be able to co convey that comfort externally as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've got one um, question that was posted on the Q&A here. Um, it's, should adverse media screening be done on all clients or just those that are higher risk? An interesting and very fair question, one that's been posed several times over the last few years. And there's a lot of firms that are focusing on their, their adverse media screening on just higher risk customers um, because of the amount of effort involved and the amount of um, output that can come out of, uh, of adverse media screening processes. Um, so you can understand that approach from uh, a resource efficiency perspective. But uh, if you look at, all, look at the forms of screening that are run, uh, typically PEP screening, um, sanctions name screening, and adverse media screening, which, uh, you know, which of those processes is most likely to flag up a, an association between uh, someone who's uh, a customer who's not on a list anywhere and allegations of criminality? It's probably the adverse media screening. Um, so, you know, is there therefore an argument to extend it across all customer types? Possibly yes, but you know, the balance has got to be struck against whether that's uh, whether that cost is bearable and then whether that's proportionate. Um, so, you, and, and because you know, we've also earlier in this discussion flagged up that static customer risk assessment models may or may not be the best way to um, assess customer risk. Uh, if we continue to deploy adverse media screening and only on the customers that our uh, risk assessment models have spat out as high risk, then we might be missing a trick. Um, and there might be um, 
medium risk and low risk customers are actually up to all sorts and uh, they would therefore as firms be running the risk that almost knowingly banking and supporting customers who are associated strongly associated incredibly associated with criminal activity now you know if that's within a firm's risk appetite that's an interesting position to try and explain well so thanks very much for your time um, and uh, have a good day everyone